Greetings, true believers, and welcome to another cosmic episode of History of the Marvel Universe. Uh, this channel is sponsored in part by Patreon supporters. If you would like to contribute and vote in monthly polls, then you can sign up for an amount of your choosing over at patreon.com slash marymarvelite. The link is in the description below along with other places you can find me. In the beginning, there was one universe, and that universe was all that there was. This original cosmos, now known as the First Firmament, was a sentient reality, presumably created by the omnipotent One Above All. However, the First Firmament did not know its creator. There was not yet a cosmic hierarchy with which it could interact. This original being, the first in all creation, simply knew that it was alone. In that loneliness, it decided to embark on its own act of creation, and conceived a race of beings to inhabit it. These monochrome celestial entities were known as the Aspirants, and they worshipped the first firmament as their god. But then, something happened that the universe itself did not expect. Its creations evolved. Among the aspirants emerged multicolored rebels, celestials who wished to explore the consequences of evolution, to see what could happen if reality itself were to change and grow. This rebellion against the status quo erupted into a celestial war a conflict that rent the cosmos asunder. While the first firmament's consciousness escaped into the endless void, its physical form, the universe itself, was shattered into pieces. This was not the end of everything, however. Rather, it was a new beginning as the shattered remnants of reality coalesced into the second iteration of the cosmos, the first multiverse. With a virtually infinite number of worlds to observe and maintain, the Celestials created their own servants, Omega beings even more powerful than themselves. Initially residing within the Second Cosmos, these Celestial Servitors have been called by a number of titles. The Omega Council, the Ivory Kings, the Kings in White, but because they ultimately made their home in the wild space beyond creation, they are most often known as Beyonders. From outside the cosmos, the Beyonders watched as the multiverse itself evolved. After only a few millennia of life, the second cosmos was eager to experience new sensations, including the sensation of death. Thus, the multiversal cycle of death and rebirth continued over countless eons. The third cosmos was the continuation, creator of the first hero, Lifebringer One. The fourth was the Pilgrim, the true believer who embarked on a journey into mystery. The fifth was the maker of magic, while the sixth was the inventor of a science. Then, following the death of that cosmos, in the endless void of nothingness between the iterations of realities, another being came into existence. Known as Null, this entity was content in the cold solitude of the Abyss, but his peace was shattered when the Big Bang heralded the creation of a new universe. The birth of the Seventh Cosmos gave rise to a new multiverse embodied by twin cosmic entities Eternity and Infinity, who represented time and space respectively. But of course, the reality that Null found himself falling into was the one we now know as the Prime Marvel Universe, Reality 616. Blinded by the light of creation, Null tumbled into the void of space for unknown eons before he beheld an incredible sight. Before him appeared the Celestials. The immense and powerful space gods had come to give Null a purpose in this new reality. While their creations worked to maintain reality from beyond the cosmos as the kings in white, the Celestials sought to install an opposite to operate from within the universe. However, Null did not respond well to this intrusion into his nothingness. Drawing forth a black blade, he struck out and beheaded one of the Celestials. 
The others banished him back into the endless void of deep space, but there he began his work. Within the hollowed-out head of the dead Celestial, now known as Nowhere, he built a forge and used it to hammer his living blade into a proper weapon, All Black the Necrosword. With this weapon at his own side, Null created an army of his own followers and became their god. Seeking to return reality to a state of absolute darkness, he hunted and enslaved other gods, eventually becoming known as the King in Black, taking the title the Celestials had meant for him, but not the duty. Meanwhile, the Beyonders were not the only ones to observe the birth and death of entire universes. Another group, the Makers, also charted the progression of universes from their inception to their entropic end. These Makers were immense beings similar in stature to the Celestials. One might presume a connection there, although none has actually been confirmed. But whether they are related to the Celestials or not, the Makers sought to construct a reality that would not be subject to the laws of entropy by weaving the structured constituents of life into its very fabric. Thus was born the Microverse, and within it an enormous galaxy in the shape of a double helix, the Spiral Path. This reality has also been referred to as Inner Space, as it was once believed to be a subatomic realm that existed within the molecules of the Prime Universe. In reality, it's more like a parallel dimension that runs alongside Reality 616, and can be accessed via shrinking. Of course, there are many other realities in the multiverse, some of which exist as possible or alternate future timelines. And so, for the next part of our story, we turn our attention to Reality 7414 in the year 17,000 AD. There, a human named Prince Wayfinder lived on the colonized planet Ithacon with his father, King Philadri Amorosan. A Wayfinder's life was changed forever when his world was attacked. The ones responsible for the destruction of Ithacon were called the Hamin. Once human explorers, the Hamin had traveled beyond the edge of their galaxy and were driven mad by what they had seen. As the sole survivor of the Ithaca, Prince Wayfinder escaped and embarked on a quest to find a legendary weapon known as the Sword in the Star. The origins of this particular blade are unknown, although in yet another reality known as Universe X, it was posited to have been empowered by the life force of Galactus. A survivor from the sixth incarnation of the cosmos who was reborn as a being with vast cosmic power in the seventh. Regardless of the sword's origins, it seems that reality itself favors balance, as one cannot have shadows without light. And so while All Black the Necroblade was a sentient weapon of darkness, the sun sword in the star was one of brightness. Wayfinder ultimately succeeded in claiming and wielding this weapon, albeit at the cost of his own eyesight. Learning to rely on a deeper form of vision, he allied with a legion of alien refugees from various universes called the Wanderers, and together they defeated the Hamin. After that, Wayfinder and his new followers traveled through time and space seeking a new home. This search eventually brought them to the prehistoric planet Earth in the distant past of Reality 616. However, there they were beset by yet another foe, wind-generating monsters called Whirl Demons. Seeking only to live in peace, Wayfinder used the Sun Sword's power to bind the demons and open a portal to the Spiral Path. Some sources credit Wayfinder with the creation of the Microverse at this moment, although how much was him and how much was the Makers remains unclear. In any event, the Wanderers became the first denizens of the Spiral Path, while the Sword in the Star merged with Wayfinder and dispersed its power throughout the Microverse. 
echoing backwards and forwards throughout time and space, this sentient energy source became known as the Enigma Force, while Wayfinder was transformed into a being simply called the Time Traveler. As a manifestation of the Enigma Force, he served both as its guardian and as a method of interacting with physical beings within the Microverse. Inner Space subsequently became home to a number of species who worshipped the Enigma Force, one of which were called the Fire Flights. These small, feminine creatures were able to commune with the Enigma Force and generate a song that soothed the savage devils. It should be noted that the Fire Flights and the Devils are not two different races or even genders, but rather the same species at different stages of an eternal life cycle. When a Fire Flight dies, it is reborn as a Devil, and vice versa. Meanwhile, the King in Black continued carving a bloody swath across the universe. While Null was a force of darkness, the Enigma Force represented a light, and so it rose up to oppose him. About 3,000 years ago, it divided itself among an army of warriors to battle Null, but the young light's forces were soon overwhelmed. In the end, the King in Black and the final Warrior of Light fought as they fell from space and crash landed on a barren, nameless planet. The two combatants had impaled each other, leaving the warrior fatally injured, and while Null survived, even he was knocked out by the fall. The two were found by an alien named Gore, who had lost his entire family to tragedy and drought. Blaming the gods for his misfortune and unanswered prayers, Gore claimed the Necrosword for himself and used its power to leave the planet. He subsequently embarked on his own quest to slaughter the Divine, earning him the title of Gore the God Butcher. Of course, that's a story for another time. In the meantime, after laying in a crater on that desolate planet for about a century, Null eventually awakened once again. After that, he created a new kind of servant when he realized that he could bond pieces of his living darkness with the local life forms. Thus was born the Symbiotes, a race of emotionless amorphous creatures who could bond with other living organisms by grafting onto their adrenal and nervous systems. Null then sent his servants, old and new, out into the universe, controlling them through a hive mind. And when the Enigma Force drew its pieces back together, it decided to become something similar to a symbiote itself. In times of need, it would manifest an energy called the Unipower and bond with a mortal host, transforming them into Captain Universe. The Enigma Force also clashed with the Symbiotes when they invaded the Microverse, but ultimately succeeded in repelling them. However, Null's rampage across creation was halted in the 6th century when he sent one of his earlier creations, the dragon-like Grendel, to Earth. The creature clashed with the mighty thunder god Thor and was struck by a bolt of magical lightning. Because the Grendel was connected to the symbiote hive mind, the shock of this attack echoed across all of Null's creations, disrupting his control. Bonding to new intelligent hosts, the symbiotes absorbed concepts like honor and nobility, which were then shared among the hive. A planet-sized mass of symbiotes then descended upon Null in an attempt to imprison him forever. Over time, enough material accumulated on the surface of this artificial world to hide its true nature, and it became known as the planet Klintar, named after the symbiote word for cage. Back to the Microverse, about a thousand years ago, a boy named Arcturus Ran was born in the first zone of the interconnected planetary system known as Homeworld. 
He was the only child of ruling magistrates Lord Dallin and Lady Sepsis, and he was also a descendant, or possibly a distant ancestor, of Prince Wayfinder, the original time traveler. Ran was tutored by the chief scientist, Karza, and regarded him as a parental figure, although Karza secretly plotted against his real parents. As an adult, Arcturus Ran became the first Micronaut, exploring the Microverse aboard the homeworld microship Endeavor. Over the following centuries, while his body was safely stored in suspended animation, he performed his exploratory duties alongside his roboid companion, Biotron 6000. However, while he was away, Karza murdered his parents and seized control of Homeworld. Furthermore, when warp drive technology was developed, it allowed Karza's forces to spread across the Microverse. Meanwhile, from outside of everything, the first firmament sought to reclaim its position as the sole embodiment of all creation. It eventually saw an opportunity to strike when the Beyonders embarked on yet another experiment. A controlled demolition of the entire multiverse, the details of which I explained in my video about the Molecule Man. The important thing for today is that Eternity, the living embodiment of the multiverse, was killed and resurrected. Reborn as a continuation of its previous self, transforming from the seventh cosmos into the eighth. This left Eternity weakened, allowing the first firmament to strike against it. The first firmament dispatched its surviving aspirants into the time stream to further corrupt and damage the multiverse. Appearing in various realities at different points in time, these intruders were called by various names, including Astro Gods and Death Celestials. As a way of immunizing reality against this threat, the Beyonders utilized a device called the Concordance Engine, which also utilized the Enigma Force. This machine acted as a sort of anchor for the unlikely. It scanned the myriad possibilities of the Polyverse, drawing an impossible number of miracles to a single place in a relatively short span of time. A concentrated dose of wonder that would produce heroes capable of fending off the Death Celestials and saving all of reality. And of course, the site of this endeavor was the planet Earth, which would become a world of marvels. As such, a number of Earthlings have been chosen by the Unipower to take on the role of Captain Universe. While hundreds of beings across the cosmos have assumed this identity, the earliest recorded human to do so was a man named Gilbert Wiles. This occurred several years before the Marvel Age of Heroes when a commercial flight was hijacked by armed gunmen. An unassuming passenger, Wiles was chosen by the Unipower and endowed with the cosmic abilities and knowledge of Captain Universe. While one of the windows was shot in the ensuing scuffle, Wiles quickly defeated the attackers and guided the plane down safely. The power left him shortly after the crisis resolved, and he subsequently dedicated his life to investigating it. Meanwhile, the Enigma Force had also grown increasingly troubled by Baron Karza's malevolent expansion throughout the Microverse. It communed with Arcturus Ran when his ship, the HMS Endeavor, reached the space wall that Prince Wayfinder had erected around the Spiral Path galaxy. The Enigma Force chose Ran to act as its champion, but did not endow him with the Unipower, as Captain Universe was always intended to be a temporary role for any who adopted it. Instead, it supercharged the Endeavor, allowing it to travel much faster than its ancient engines should have been capable of, and made the telepathic link between Ran and Biotron permanent. Furthermore, Ran's mind was used to spawn a legion of ethereal time travelers, similar to the original one that Prince Wayfinder had transformed into. 
Ran and Biotron then returned to Homeworld and assembled a team of freedom fighters called the Micronauts to oppose the tyrannical rule of Baron Kurza. Escaping from the Baron's clutches, the Micronauts pierced the space wall and were transported to Earth. But because travel between these two layers of reality involved the energy released by shrinking and growing, it often resulted in a relative size differential when done imprecisely. Put more simply, when the Micronauts arrived at Daytona Beach in Florida, they emerged at roughly one-twelfth the size of a normal human. They were pursued by Kurz's forces, but the Micronauts were aided by a boy named Steve Coffin, who helped destroy the similarly reduced spacecraft. Steve was the son of Ray Coffin, a former astronaut who had been a single father since the death of his wife. While Ray was shocked by the state of his backyard after the attack from Kurz's forces, he soon realized that the broken spaceships were more than just toys when he inspected the wreckage for himself. Ray's investigation soon brought him to Cape Canaveral's Human Engineering Life Laboratory, or HELL, which was run by the cyborg professor Philip Prometheus. As it turns out, Prometheus had already discovered the existence of the Microverse, and had developed an experimental portal called the Prometheus Pit to travel there. However, he was also quite mad, and when young Steve mentioned Arcturus Rand, Prometheus attacked, demanding to know where the Micronauts were. The tiny heroes arrived to intervene, and Ray Coffin tackled Prometheus with both men tumbling into the Prometheus pit. Falling into the Microverse, Ray was found by the Time Traveler, who appointed him Earth's champion against Kurz's forces. This was none too soon, as the Baron was able to use the Prometheus pit to reach Earth with his full size and power. Endowed with the might of the Unipower, Ray Coffin transformed into Captain Universe and returned to the Earth dimension to battle Baron Kurza. His foe was mighty, but Captain Universe was ultimately able to push the Baron back. Kurza fled to pursue the Micronauts back through the Prometheus Pit for fear of being cut off from his empire. And sure enough, once Kurza had returned to the Microverse, the Time Travelers sealed off the portal from which he came. With his duty completed, the Unipower left Coffin to await the day it was needed once again. That time came when a new threat arrived on Earth in the form of the shadow creature Mr. E. Claiming to originate from a dark realm called the Shadowverse, Mr. E was actually a creation of Null, who wished to conquer the planet and be worshipped as a god itself. It attacked Cape Canaveral using NASA employee Lewis Tuttle as a host, and converted many others into its shadow slaves. It plotted to bombard the sun with negatron particles, transforming it into a black star and casting the Earth in darkness. The Unipower attempted to bond with Ray Coffin once again, but his heart could not bear the strain of another transformation. He was brought to Cape Kennedy's hospital, but there Mr. E's symbiotic shadows attempted to overtake him. Fortunately, he was saved when the Enigma Force endowed his son, Steve Coffin, with its light. As Captain Universe, Steve defeated Mr. E and thwarted the monster's plans. The Unipower then left once again, but not before healing Ray Coffin's damaged heart. The next time it manifested on Earth, the Unipower was split between twin sisters, Claire Dodson and Anne Stanford, resulting in two Captain's Universe. While Claire was a private detective, Anne was a housewife with two children. Together, they defeated the masked crime lord Nemesis and exposed him as Anne's husband, District Attorney Edward Stanford. The Enigma Force next took notice of a cat burglar named Monty Walsh, who'd stolen from the gangster Guido Carboni. Walsh was shot by Carboni's agents, but his life was saved when he was endowed with the Unipower. As Captain Universe, he defeated the gangster and planned on taking over his position. 
However, the Unipower then left him, and Walsh swiftly perished from his fatal gunshot wounds. Meanwhile, back in the Microverse, Arcturus Ran and his team continued to clash with the forces of Baron Karza. In one battle, Ran connected with the Enigma Force and manifested himself as a time traveler. After seemingly destroying Karza, this incarnation of the Time Traveler separated from Ran to rejoin the Enigma Force. However, Karza's spirit survived, allowing him to later return. After again pursuing the Micronauts to Earth, he forcefully plundered Ran's mind and bound the Enigma Force to himself. With the Baron more powerful than ever, the Microverse denizen Queen Esmera of Calaclac sacrificed herself by striking him with her suicide sting. This weakened Karza enough for the Micronaut Acroyer to use his planet's world mind to vanquish him once again, albeit at the cost of his home planet Spartak. With the Enigma Force rendered dormant, the world demons that Prince Wayfinder had sealed away were released and mounted an attack on the Microverse. Joining forces with Doctor Strange, Arcturus Ran used three keys to access the Tomb of the Wayfinder in the Dead Zone of Homeworld. Within, they found the legendary Sword in the Star and fully restored the Enigma Force. Briefly merging into a single Captain Universe, Strange and Ran used the Unipower to strengthen the space wall and prevent their dimensions from colliding. Meanwhile, a member of the Fireflight race sacrificed herself to seal the world demons away once again, pouring her very soul into a final song. Back on Earth, there was an incident involving an insane military officer, Jamie Custer, who modeled himself after the infamous General George Armstrong Custer. Mistaking the sounds of a Hulk rampage for a Russian attack, Custer murdered his commanding officer and prepared to launch a nuclear strike on Moscow. In an attempt to prevent this, the Enigma Force bonded the Unipower to Bruce Banner, separating him from the Hulk. This, however, resulted in a confrontation between Captain Universe and the Incredible Hulk. While they fought, the authorities reached Custer and fatally shot him, but failed to stop him from initiating the launch. Fortunately, Captain Universe was able to destroy the missile and neutralize the fallout before it touched down. The Hulk was nearly caught in the blast, but the Unipower merged him and Banner again, safely returning them to Earth before departing. An unidentified woman endowed with the power of Captain Universe was later seen among the potential participants in a contest of champions held by the Grandmaster, and so her story is likely one of many undocumented incidents involving the Unipower. Its next known appearance occurred when a teacher named Yvonne Leslie was attacked by a violent teenager, Willie Johnson. A younger student named Delane Masters was briefly transformed into Captain Universe and fought back. While the Unipower left him in the middle of the fight, the experience gave Masters the courage to stand up to Johnson. Witnessing this, other young students jumped in to help, ensuring that they would not allow bullies to run rampant. Later, there was an incident in which an alien called the Quantum Mechanic plotted to break the Earth down into subatomic particles. To combat this, the Unipower transformed a nearby physics professor, Evan Swan, into Captain Universe. After that, there was an event called the Axe of Vengeance in which the trickster god Loki conspired with Earth's supervillains to keep the heroes off balance by forcing them to fight opponents they had never encountered before. During this time, the Enigma Force chose Peter Parker, the spectacular Spider-Man, to be the next recipient of the Unipower. However, when it attempted to bond with him, Peter was in the middle of helping a colleague of Professor Swan, Max Lubish. He had developed a machine designed to tap into an extra-dimensional energy source. When this device overloaded the university's electrical system and went haywire, Peter was struck with a bolt of energy. 
This set of circumstances caused him to gain the powers of Captain Universe, but without the knowledge that came with it. Assuming that his new abilities were the result of the lab accident, Spider-Man battled a number of enemies during the Acts of Vengeance conspiracy, including Graviton, Magneto, the Grey Hulk, and several others. When the Avengers foiled Loki's plans, he decided to play a final trick by merging three mutant hunting sentinel robots into a single Tri-Sentinel. As it turns out, this was the danger that Peter had been chosen to combat. And so, despite efforts from Sebastian Shaw to use Lubish's machine to depower Spider-Man, the Unipower fully manifested and transformed the hero into Captain Universe. Now aware of his purpose, Spider-Man destroyed the Tri-Sentinel before the Unipower left him once again. Now, there have been a number of other individuals to bear the name Captain Universe since then, but unfortunately we are completely out of time for this episode. And so if you'd like to hear about some of the other recipients of the Unipower, be sure to let me know in the comments below. In the meantime, if you would like to read about the battle with the Death Celestials, then you can check out Matt Fraction's Defenders book from 2012. For the first Firmament's War Against Eternity, that's in 2017's Ultimates 2 by Al Ewing. And for the return of Null and the subsequent battle with him, you can check out Donny Cates' Venom run, including Absolute Carnage and The King in Black. But thank you all so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and share it on your favorite social media. As always, the issues referenced in this video are listed in the description below if you would like to read them for yourself, as well as links to other places you can find me, including my Patreon page where, for only a dollar a month, you can get your name in these special thanks here and vote in monthly polls that help decide what topics get covered on the channel. But that is indeed all I have for you today, and so until next time, true believers, Excelsior!